text this morning is 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 7 through 11. And the title of our sermon, Our Glorious Ministry. Our Glorious Ministry. In our verse-by-verse study of 2 Corinthians to this point, we have made note of the fact that Paul has entered into one of the most glorious expositions of the Christian ministry in all of the New Testament. In a section of scripture that runs from 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14 through 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 5, Paul pours out his heart, wears his heart on his sleeve so to speak, pouring out his heart to the Corinthian church and to our church by implication here. Lending a a treasure trove of support to his opening statement in chapter 2, verse 14, where Paul says, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. Now in stark and bitter contrast with those false teachers now in Corinth who peddle the word of God for profit, Paul begins chapter 3 by commending the work of God through his ministry By pointing to the Corinthians themselves in verse 3. Paul says, clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. Now with that statement, Paul draws a very clear distinction. It's not like a line in the sand, per se. It's more like a a line in the heavens, right? Drawn from the cross to the very throne room of God. A line that distinguishes between that which is old and that which is new. That which is type and copy and shadow and that which is true and genuine and real. A distinction in verse 6 between that which kills and the spirit who gives life. The final word in God's provision for sin, the final word in God's plan to redeem a people for himself was not given at Sinai. Paul says we are, by the grace of God, ministers of a new and better covenant. A new covenant that God has made with his people. A better covenant, according to Hebrews chapter 8. Established on better promises. A new covenant, a better covenant with a better mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ. God says, I will put my law on their minds and I will write it on their hearts. He says, I'll give you a new heart. I'll put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you, and I will cause you to walk in my statutes. It's a covenant that is secured, blood-bought and mediated by our great high priest, purchased by the shed blood of God's only begotten Son, who, through his sacrifice, did for us what we could never do for ourselves. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. What a glorious salvation, right? An amazing, glorious salvation from an infinitely wise and gracious and loving Creator. What a great salvation. As we come to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 7-11 through then, what may have begun as a defense of His ministry... Paul recommissions now and reorients as a contemplation or a meditation on the glory of this new covenant ministry. In fact, the word for glory here, it's cognate, it shows up ten times in these five verses. Verses that describe the glory of the new covenant ministry in contrast with the old. Now note with me also, It's not only the covenant itself that is the direct object of that glory. It's the ministry, right? The ministry of the Spirit that is more glorious in verse 8. It's the ministry of righteousness that exceeds much more in glory in verse 9. That word again for ministry used four times in these five verses. So Paul isn't, as we come to this text, Paul isn't boasting here in the glory of his own ministry, so to speak. Paul is rejoicing, right? Paul is glorying in or reveling in the gospel of the glory of Christ. He's glorying in the glory of the glorious new covenant, right? Which is glorious 
because of the glory of the triune God. God who has chosen to glorify himself in the salvation of inglorious rebels like you and I. It is a glorious salvation. It is a glorious covenant. Amen? Now what is furthermore glorious to the Apostle Paul is that he, the chief of sinners, a wretch, a rebel, was shown such grace that he could minister the infinite riches of such glorious truth. Right? It's an amazing fact when you stop to think about it. All that treasure, Paul says, in clay pots. All that treasure in a clay pot. What's furthermore glorious, if you consider this with Paul from this text, what is furthermore glorious is the truth that that applies to every single believer in Christ. That truth applies to everyone who is in Christ. All who are in Christ have been given this ministry of glory, this ministry of truth. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, just a page to the right. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and look at verse 16. If you are in Christ, right? If you're in Christ, then this treasure has been given to you. You carry this treasure in your own clay pot, so to speak. A mere earthen vessel. We know that God has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness, right? He will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. And he has given assurance of this to all by raising that man, the Lord Jesus Christ, from the dead. Knowing, therefore, Paul says, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Therefore, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. Therefore, Paul says, from now on, understanding these things, understanding this reality, we regard no one according to the flesh. In other words, Paul no longer looked on anyone as merely flesh and blood, right? The days of their life, a mere 70 years or by 80, by reason of strength. No, that's not the way that Paul looked at anyone any longer. Every single human being possesses a soul that will live forever. Sometimes it's easy to lose sight of that. But your most valuable possession is your ever living soul. It's the most important thing to you. If you're here today and you don't know Christ, you have an ever living soul. You may die in this life, but your soul will live forever. Where will you go when you die? If you're here, brother, sister, the most important thing that you have to be concerned with is your soul, the state of your soul, the condition of your soul. Every single human being possesses a soul that will live forever. Live forever in heaven or live forever in a devil's hell. Even though, Paul says, we have known Christ even according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Paul may have once known Christ as merely a man, as merely a carpenter from Nazareth. Now, though, now Paul knows the truth. Now he knows Christ as the God-man. God incarnate, the Savior of men, right? Verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. If anyone, if anyone is in Christ, then old desires have passed away. Amen? If anyone is in Christ, then old priorities have passed away. Old sinful practices, old loves, old plans, old beliefs, old ways of thinking, all of that has passed away. These replaced by new desires, new priorities, new practices, new plans, new loves, new beliefs, new ways of thinking. Verse 18, now all things, now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. Who's the us? The us is the anyone who is in Christ. Anyone who is in Christ, verse 17, now all things are of God, verse 18, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us, the anyone who is in Christ, has been given the ministry of reconciliation. That is, verse 19, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and he has committed to us the word of of reconciliation. Can't get any more clear, can it? Right? The Lord has given us 
the ministry of reconciliation. He has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, verse 20, we, you and I, if you're in Christ, if you're in Christ, then you are an ambassador for Christ. Amen? You are an ambassador for Christ as though God were pleading through you. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We are ambassadors for Christ. We implore you on Christ's behalf, verse 20, be reconciled to God. Why? Why? Because of this glorious new covenant. Because of this glorious salvation. Why should we plead with men? Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Why should we persuade? Why should we plead? Why do we go out and knock on doors? Why do you approach a stranger to preach the gospel? Why do you labor in prayer over friends and family members? Why do you preach the gospel at work, at school? Right? Why do you preach the gospel to the scorn of your family, to the derision of your friends? Why? 4, verse 21, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Glory. Amen? Glorious. That is a glorious ministry. You sit here today, outside of Christ, a sinner, deserving of hell, deserving of judgment, facing a devil's hell forever. But in Christ, you can be forgiven of your sin. In Christ, you can be free. In Christ, you can go to heaven when you die. You can be with Christ for all of eternity. In Christ. Christ, who knew no sin, was made to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. That's why we preach the gospel. Right? That's why we labor over souls to see them saved. That's why some of you pray and pray and weep and pray and weep and pray. We have been given... This glorious ministry. We, former enemies of God, right? Now His ambassadors. Former blasphemers. Former idolaters. Now heralds for the King. Now proclaimers of peace with God. Paul didn't see this ministry. He didn't see this ministry as merely his duty, right? Woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. He certainly did see it as his duty, but not merely as his duty. Paul saw this ministry, his new covenant word of reconciliation, not simply as his duty, but preeminently Paul saw it as his life's delight. It was his delight. Why? For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. It was his delight. Is it your delight? Why? Why not? What was Paul's motivation, right? What was Paul's... What fueled his zeal? Where did his fervency, his earnestness come from? What fueled his perseverance? Just like you and I. Just like you and I. Paul was sent into a world that hated Christ and hated the gospel. You don't sense that. This world hates Christ and hates the gospel. you got to get out more. (laughs) Maybe you need to preach the gospel to a few people. You'll figure it out pretty quick, right? You testify of it that its deeds are evil. Jesus says the world will hate you for it. Why? Because they hated him first. They hated him. They're going to hate us too. We're not above our master. It's certainly true for you and I today. The the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Just like us. And far, far more, Paul faced the scorn and derision and mocking of men. Paul faced significant persecution. Paul faced times where he feared for his life. He was in constant danger, constant peril. Outside, Paul says, were conflicts. Inside were fears. He faced discouragement internally. He faced heartache and anguish internally. He had to stare down the faces of people who wanted to see him dead in order to preach the gospel to them in hopes that they might be saved. Paul knew what it was like to sacrifice for the sake of the gospel. He was materially poorer than anyone in this room. He went hungry. Paul was 
physically and literally worn down and worn out for the gospel. And yet gospel ministry was his life's delight. That ministry was Paul's delight. Why? What was Paul's motivation? Right? What fueled him? What fueled his zeal? Is evangelizing the lost, is preaching the gospel, is that your delight? Do you want to see lost sinners saved? Do you want to see parents? Do you want to see your kids saved? Do you want to see that friend, that coworker? Right? Do you want to see them saved? Do you want to see the lost people on your street saved? The person you meet at the store? The person that you, do you see them according to the flesh? Or do you see them as a never dying soul who needs Christ? It's clear from the Bible. It is crystal clear from the Bible that this is our duty. There's no mistaking that. Don't argue with the scripture in your mind about that. Settle it in your heart. It is your duty. But listen, it's to be our heart's delight. It's to be our delight. Where do we find, where do we find that kind of courage? Right? Where do we find that kind of zeal? Where do we find that heart? Right? Where do we find that kind of that kind of gospel worthy fearlessness that Paul had? Right? Where do we get a taste of that? How is it that we can take up this ministry as Paul did and find our delight in it? Where do we find the determination to press on in faithfulness when fruit is scarce? How do you battle discouragement and that, that stinking thinking that says, ah, he's not going to respond good anyway. <laughs> and press on and preach the gospel in spite of that. When all you seem to be doing is preaching to veiled hearts and deaf ears and stubborn hearts, right? Where do we find the power to continue when our resolve is weak? And our faith is sometimes small. When you're tempted to shrink back. When you're tempted or enticed by comfort. Enticed by leisure. Enticed by sitting at home. Enticed by a busy schedule to neglect that call. What is my motivation what should fuel my zeal? What should fuel your fervency for this calling, this work? Even in the midst of persecution that many of you have experienced and is coming even more. Even in the midst of affliction, in the midst of difficulty. Paul says that that motivation, right, that fuel is at least in part contained right here in this text. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 7 through 11, where Paul considers the glory of the new covenant gospel preaching Christian ministry. Paul says, what's my motivation? Glory is. Glory. The same glory you rejoiced in when you were saved from sin and the wrath to come. What fuels my zeal, Paul says? Glory. Where do we find determination, resolve, fervency, zeal, diligence, courage? Glory, Paul says, the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Not only duty, but delight, right? Not merely guilt, but glory. Paul says, my motivation is the glory of this ministry. The Paul elucidates that glory, the glory of our blessed ministry, by discussing it, term, discussing it in terms of three contrasts from our text. And you'll find these contrasts in your notes. One, the ministry of death versus the ministry of the Spirit. We see that in verses 7 and 8. Two, the ministry of condemnation versus the ministry of righteousness in verses 7 or in verses 9 through 10. And third... The ministry of the old versus the ministry of the new in verse 11. The ministry of death versus the ministry of the spirit, verses 7 and 8. The ministry of condemnation versus the ministry of righteousness in verses 9 and 10. The ministry of the old versus the ministry of the new in verse 11. Brother and sister, listen. We need to allow our hearts to be moved by this text. 
right? These are glorious truths, no mistaking. We need to meditate on them. We need to think about them. We need to consider them, and we need to allow the Spirit of God to move our hearts with respect to them. We need to be fueled with zeal, faithfulness, fervency. We need to have our faith grown, right? Pray now, even now, that the Spirit of God would grip your heart over the glory of our given ministry. You and I have a glorious work to do. We're in that time period now, the end days, where the gospel of the kingdom is being preached to the four corners of this earth. We have our part to play in that. We have our torch to bear in that work. Are we doing a good job of that? Are we being faithful, right? We can abound in this work. Let us abound in it for the glory of God. Amen? Let us abound in it. Like Jacob did with the angel of the Lord, don't let the truths of this text go until they bless you. Okay? Let's think about this. Let's meditate on it. Paul explains that it is these truths in this text that at least in part stoke the fires of his ministry. And he says this in verse 12. Therefore, verse 12, since we have such hope, we have the glories of this ministry, this great salvation that's been given to us. Since we have such hope, we use, Paul says, great boldness of speech. That word boldness means not shrinking back. It means pressing on even in the midst of risk, even in the midst of difficulty, adversity, affliction. We have great courage, great boldness of speech. Let's look at point one then. The ministry of death versus the ministry of the Spirit in verses 7 and 8. Now notice first with me, the beginning of verse 7, that little word, but. If you have a new King James, I believe in NASB, it begins with that little word, but, at the beginning of verse 7. That word is better translated now as it is by the ESV. It's not a contrast with what comes before, but a continuation of what comes before. Paul says in verse 6, look at verse 6. We are ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now, having established the basis for his contrast between the old covenant and the letter which kills, and the new covenant and the ministry of the Spirit who gives life, Paul then continues to explain now in verses 7 through 11 the substance of that contrast. Look at verse 7. Again, better translated now, right? Now, if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? Paul begins our text with the first of three contrasts. I want you to see this in the text. It makes the text easier to understand, all right? The first, the glory of the ministry of death and the glory of the ministry of the Spirit. If you remove the explanatory clauses or statements from verse 7, the contrast becomes more clear. Look at verse 7. If the ministry of death was glorious... Then, verse 8, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? Do you see the contrast? All right, now, each of the three contrasts in our text are set up in exactly the same way. There's an if statement. You're a grammar guy or gal. It's called a protasis. Followed by a then statement called an apodosis. And then what you get here is an argument from the lesser to the greater. If the ministry of death was glorious... And how much more then, so-called, the ministry of the Spirit is much more glorious, exceeding in glory, right? So now, the ministry of death, verse 7, that Paul is referring to, is the ministry of the letter which kills in verse 6. It is the ministry written and engraved on stones in verse 7, rather than on tablets of flesh, that is, on the heart from verse 3. In other words, this ministry that Paul is referring to in verse 7 is the ministry of the old covenant that we looked at together last week. 
Last Lord's Day, when we looked at verses 1 through 6, we looked at the Old Covenant in contrast with the New Covenant. This is, again, a reference to that Old Covenant. The Old Covenant that cannot change the heart, right? The Old Covenant that cannot transform the person. It cannot supply strength. It cannot effect obedience. It cannot produce the righteousness that we need in order to stand before God. All that the written code or all that the written covenant, all that the law can do is to stand by in condemnation of those who fail to keep it. The law condemns. In that sense, verse 6, the law or the letter kills. The law brings the knowledge of our guilt, brings the knowledge of sin, shame, judgment. Galatians 3.10 again, for as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 26. Cursed is the one who does not confirm all the words of this law by observing them. Listen, if you're not in Christ through repentant faith in Him, you're not living for the Lord Jesus Christ, you are born under the law, you are under this curse. Man, woman, child, listen to me. Young man, young girl, young boy. Cursed is the one who does not confirm all the words of this law by observing them. Cursed. Paul explained that the law actually stirs up sinful passions, sinful desires within us. He said this in Romans chapter 7, verse 7. I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. But sin... Taking opportunity by the commandment produced in me all manner of evil desire. Now, if you have kids, you know exactly what Paul's talking about here, right? Don't touch that. Well, you've just put them on a laser-focused mission to touch that, whatever that is, right? That's the way it works. The law stirs up evil desire within us. That's what Paul is saying here, right? Paul says, apart from the law, apart from the law, sin was dead I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it, by the commandment, it killed me. The old covenant written letter, in and of itself, kills. It kills is the law therefore sin? Is the law evil? Does it do, so to speak, sin? Does it do evil? No. No, Paul says that the law is glorious. Paul says that the law is glorious. Paul goes on to say in Romans chapter 7 verse 12, the law is holy and the commandment holy, just, and good. Listen to this from Psalm 19, beginning in verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear, another word of uh, work for the law of God, right? The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold. If you're a genuine Christian, you know exactly what's being referred to you here by the psalmist, right? You hunger and thirst for righteousness, right? You desire in every way to live pleasing to him, right? That's the heart of the Christian. More to be desired are they than gold, the psalmist says, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. The law is glorious. The law is glorious. Look with me at Exodus 19. Exodus chapter 19. Turn there with me. Exodus chapter 19. 
And here we are, the Israelites, the children of Israel, are in the wilderness. God has delivered them from the fiery furnace in Egypt. And they're now in the wilderness, gathered at Mount Sinai, and God is about to give them His law. Look at verse 16, Exodus chapter 19, verse 16. Listen to how Moses here elucidates the glory of God at Mount Sinai. Verse 16, Then it came to pass on the third day, in the morning, that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain. And the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of that mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by voice. And then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain. And the Lord called to Moses from the, to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. And the Lord said to Moses, go down, warn the people as they break through to gaze at the Lord. And many of them perish, even to look upon the Lord. To look upon the Lord's glory was potential death, right? Let them not break through to gaze at the Lord and many of them perish. Verse 22, also let the priests who come near the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. Verse 23, but Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you warned us, saying, set bounds around the mountain and consecrate it. Verse 24, the Lord said to him, rebuking him, right? Verse 24, away, I said, get down and then come up, you and Aaron with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. And so Moses went down to the people and spoke to them. We have the author to the letter of the he to the Hebrews, describing this scene in verse or in chapter twelve. Listen to this: that mountain, our author said, that mountain burned with fire, and to blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the words should not be spoken to them any more. For they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot through with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. Right? Can you imagine? Can you imagine being around that mountain? The lightning, the thunder, the smoke, the fire, the trumpet blaring in your ears, the voice of God. I mean, glory, right? Glorious. That is the power and holiness of God. Who can stand before Him and live? Who can gaze upon the face of God and live? No one, right? Nahum. Chapter 1, verse 5. The mountains quake before him. The hills melt. The earth heaves at his presence. Yes, the world and all who dwell in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. Right? Great and terrifying glory. Terrifying glory. And that's... Almost an absurdly minuscule demonstration of the power and glory of God. Right? Just a fraction of the power and glory and might and holiness of God. Our God is a consuming fire, the Bible says. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7, Paul explains that the ministry of death the ministry of death was glorious so that the children of Israel couldn't even look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away. 
Think about that for a moment, right? Afraid even to look into the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance. Flip a few pages to the right and look at Exodus chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34. God does give the law to Moses written on tablets of stone. Moses comes down from the mountain, finds the Israelites in idolatry under Aaron, building a golden calf. In righteous indignation, Moses breaks the tablets. And the Lord reestablishes this covenant with him in Exodus 34, makes two new tablets of the testimony that were given to Moses. And we find this reported or accounted for in Exodus chapter 34, beginning in verse 29. And again, consider the glory of the old covenant. Verse 29. Now it was so that when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand when he came down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him, while he talked with God, the skin of his face was shining. So when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone. And listen to this. They were afraid to come near him. I think for a moment, why would they be afraid? Why would they be afraid? Verse 31. Then Moses called to them, and Aaron, and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him. And Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the children of Israel came near, and he gave them as commandments all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And he would come out and speak to the children of Israel when it, whatever he had been commanded. And whenever the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone, then Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him, with God. What this is essentially in Exodus 34 is the very glory of God shining in the face of Moses, right? The very glory of God, the holiness of God, the character of God shining in the face of Moses. One commentator said that his face radiating the residual rays of divine glory. I like that, right? So much so, so much so that the children of Israel were afraid to go near him. Were afraid to look at the face of Moses because of the glory. Now why is that? Why is that? Lest they die. Lest they die. Those lessons from Exodus 20 weren't lost on them. Don't go near him. Don't look into his glory. Don't look into his face. God is holy. God is holy and you are not. It's amazing today how flippant people are about the glory of God, the worship of God, the holiness of God. That God is some grandfatherly, elderly, feeble, walking with a walker, God in heaven who just forget, oh, pats you on the head, right? not concerned at all with sin. That's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is fiercely jealous of his own glory, of his own holiness. He is holy. The holiness of God is glorious. So much so that Moses, his face shone after speaking with him. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And the Israelites knew it. And the Israelites feared him in that way. Feared God. To stand before God, to stand before God as unrighteous means certain death means certain death. Listen, if you stand before God unrighteous, you will die. You will perish. You will perish eternally. To stand before God unrighteous means your death. Fear Him in that respect. If, you're, if you don't have a righteousness that is acceptable before Him, and you will die in your own unrighteousness and face his wrath for eternity. They knew 
They knew that their sinful condition was a cause for death. They knew that their sin was a cause for their death. The law, as it was, the law defined the absolute perfections of God. The law was a reflection of His holy character, God's demands. And the law demonstrates how fatally far we fall short of it. How fatally far away we are from His absolute standard. But listen, the law, as glorious as that is, because it reflects the character and nature of God, the law cannot change us. The law can't change our hearts. The law cannot provide the power or the efficacy to meet the just demands of a holy God. All the law can do is point at us and condemn us. All the law can do is show us our sin. The law, through no fault of its own, the law can only bring death. Paul said again, Romans chapter 7, verse 11, Sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. Back in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, just as the residual glory shining in the face of Moses began to fade, as soon as Moses came down from the mountain, the glory of that covenant began to fade as well. The glory of that covenant began to fade at its inception. It was merely pointing forward, pointing forward to a time at which it would become obsolete or rendered powerless. If that ministry, verse 7, if that ministry was glorious, then, verse 8, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? Think about the glory of that old covenant. How will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? If that kind of terrifying and majestic and powerful glory, if that kind of glory attended the ministry of death, then how much more would glory attend the ministry of the Spirit who gives life, right? Rather than death, the Spirit gives life. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ is far, far greater. There is no comparison, really. Infinitely greater. Gazing upon that glory doesn't bring death, right? Gazing upon that glory doesn't bring fear. On the contrary, if you look at chapter 3, verse 18, but we all, chapter 3, verse 18, we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed now into that same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. Right? Far more glorious. Romans chapter 8, verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Amen. This, this ministry, this ministry is the ministry of the new covenant. It is the ministry of blood-bought, spirit-wrought regeneration, right? New birth, forgiveness of sins, indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That which is pronounced dead in trespasses and sins, He makes alive in Christ Jesus by faith in Him. It is a glorious covenant, right? Far, far more glorious, far more glorious. Many of you, when you first came to Christ, maybe when the Lord was drawing you to Himself, you came under great conviction because of your sin. You understood clearly, if you're in Christ, you understood clearly your offenses against Him. How that sin not only separated you from Him, but made you deserving of eternal wrath. How you as a sinner are a stench in His nostrils. One who made you. One who created you. But in thinking about that sin, and thinking about your offense before God, 
when the gospel was presented to you and you considered that God's own son took your place on the tree and bore the wrath that you deserved, took your punishment on himself so that you could be forgiven, glory and Glory upon glory upon glory, right? Matchless glory. Eternal, eternal glory. The love that God has shown to you in the gospel, the sacrifice of Christ, His substitution, far, far, far more glorious. Far more glorious. Back in Second Corinthians chapter 3, the remaining two covenants in our text are ex- essentially their explanatory extensions of this contrast that Paul establishes in verses 7 through 8. Right? Look at point two on your notes then. Now, the ministry of condemnation versus the ministry of righteousness. Look at verse 9. For if the ministry of condemnation, it's this same ministry, right? Ministry of the old covenant. Ministry of death. Now explained as the ministry of condemnation. If that old covenant, if that ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness, the ministry of life in the Spirit, the ministry of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, that ministry exceeds much more. In other words, it abounds. It abounds in glory. Now this is the same point, verse 9, from a slightly different perspective, right? Or related in different terms here. If that old ministry of death and condemnation and damnation, if that ministry had glory, then how much more the ministry of the gospel, which leads to righteousness and life. In fact, Paul says here in verse 9, it exceeds much more. It abounds in glory. And that is an understatement, right? That is, that's an understatement. It's just not words to explain how much it exceeds the other in glory. One merely pronounces condemnation, right? The wages of sin is death. It actually places you before the bar of God's perfect and unyielding justice with no other option but hell. The other actually delivers you from death, delivers you from condemnation, delivers you from the wrath of God in hell. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Right? That is far, far exceeding the glory of the Old Covenant. Amen? Far exceeds the Old Covenant in glory because it actually provides for you, provides for me that which the Old Covenant could never provide. And for that reason, it's called here the ministry of righteousness. It actually provides that which the old covenant couldn't it's called the ministry of righteousness eternal life right eternal life under the new covenant is is essentially an issue of righteousness isn't it we think about salvation we think about being reconciled to god being right with god it's essentially an issue of righteousness god is righteous and you are not right god is righteous i ain't Right? You don't have the perfect righteousness that is required for you to stand before a holy God. For you to have fellowship with God. For you to enter into His fellowship. You must be perfectly righteous and you don't have it. It's an issue of righteousness. Because you lack the requisite righteousness that you need to stand before God, you are condemned then by the law. You're condemned. How is it then that you can be made righteous? It's through the ministry of righteousness. Job asks the same question, doesn't he? Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Try as you may. Try as you may. But if it's left to you, you will always, always be filthy in God's sight. Apart from His provision... To be made clean, you will never have the righteousness that you need. And someone may say, listen, I'm going to do my best. 
Do your best. I just need to clean up my act a little bit, right? I'm going to get my life together. I just need to go to church. I need to get back involved. I need to get the kids going, right? Do all those things. But you don't have righteousness. You don't have the righteousness that that you need. I think I'm a pretty good person. Yeah, no, you're not. Not by God's holy standard. There's one good. One good, right? Romans chapter 1. Turn there with me. Romans chapter 1. You and I need righteousness. Romans chapter 1. Look at verse 16. Paul reveled in this ministry that he was given by the Lord Jesus Christ. He rejoiced in it. It was his joy. It was his delight. He says in Romans chapter 1 verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it, the gospel of Christ, is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Let's look at some clarification of what Paul's talking about there. Flip the page and look at Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. And look at verse 19. After giving one of the most damning indictments against men in Romans chapter 3 verses 9 through 18 Paul says this in verse 19 now we know that whatever the law says it says to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God I was witnessing to a guy here not long ago And just couldn't get past the idea that he was guilty. I don't feel guilty. I don't see myself as guilty. I just don't see myself as that bad of a person. Really lead a pretty good life. I don't really sin. We know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. Is he under the law? Yes, he is. Am I apart from Christ? Yes. Are you apart from Christ? Yes. It says to those who are under the law... So that every mouth may be stopped. Just put your hand over your mouth. Just shut your mouth. Listen to the diagnosis. Accept what's being said of you. So that all the world may become guilty before God. Verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, by works, by your effort, no flesh will be justified, made right with him in his sight. For by the law is not justification, it's not righteousness, for by the law is the knowledge of sin, verse 21. But now, the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. Where is it revealed? It's revealed in the gospel. It's revealed in the gospel. The righteousness of God, that righteousness that you need. That righteousness that you need to stand before a holy God is revealed here in the gospel. Verse 21, the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is yours and mine, through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who work really hard at it. Right? No. Who are just going to get their lives cleaned up again? No. Just going to try to be a good person? No. To all and on all who believe. Works are not the vehicle through which we attain the righteousness that we need to stand before God. Doing anything, right? Praying more. Reading your Bible more. All good things, right? All good things. Reading your Bible more. Going to church more. Being faithful, loving your brothers more, serving your brothers more. None of it. Works are not the vehicle through which we attain the righteousness that we need to stand before a holy God. Faith in Christ is the vehicle through which we are given the righteousness that we need. 
Paul says there is no difference. Verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified or made right freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Verse 25, whom God set forth as a propitiation, as a wrath satisfying sacrifice by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his patience or forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. There is so much said there worthy of many, many sermons, which we don't have time to get into this morning. The righteousness that you and I need is given to us as a free gift of God's grace through the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, faith alone in Christ alone. On the basis of faith, his righteousness, listen, on the basis of faith, Christ's substitutionary work, his person and his work, His righteousness becomes our righteousness. His righteousness becomes my righteousness. My sin is credited or imputed to him. He takes my sin upon himself, stands in my place, and bears my punishment, right? His righteousness, his perfect life is credited or imputed to me by faith. And it's that Righteousness that I need to stand before God, clothed in white linen, clean, right? Forgiven of sin. You say you need to clean up your life a little bit? Good luck with that. You just need to do a little bit better? Let me know how that works out for you. You say, God will simply forgive me. (laughs) Then why did his son have to come and die? He calls you to turn from your sin and put your faith and trust in him. You say, God knows my heart. You're certainly right. He does. Every filthy inch of it. (laughs) God does know your heart. And he says that it is desperately wicked, deceitful above all things. You need righteousness. And that only, only comes through Jesus Christ. There are many paths up the mountain to God. No, there are not. There is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. One name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ alone. You need righteousness. Your Muslim friend needs righteousness. Your Mormon friend needs righteousness. That Catholic co-worker needs a righteousness that is not from works of the law, but through faith in Christ alone. We need righteousness. This is the glory of the ministry of righteousness that the covenant God in grace through Christ gives us what we can't attain for ourselves and what we don't have. He provides it for us. The ministry of death provides no righteousness. It simply declares you unrighteous. The ministry of the spirit of life provides for you the righteousness that you need. Back in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. This is the glory of the ministry of righteousness. Look at verse 10. Explaining this, right? Explaining this. Paul says in verse 10, For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels or abounds. In other words, that old covenant that was made glory was rendered essentially inglorious or without glory because of the abounding glory of the new. In other words, if you go outside, right, at night, and you look up and you see the stars in the sky, I've seen a picture of just a beautiful sky with a star, the moon shining, the stars shining. It's glorious. It's beautiful. Right? I've got a picture on my desktop of that, the stars, just how beautiful that sight is. But what happens in the morning? The stars don't go away. The moon doesn't disappear. They are eclipsed in glory, so to speak. 
You can't even see them any longer because of the glory of the sun. It's that kind of glory here. That's, that's, that's essentially the essence of Paul's statement in verse 10. It's as if the old has no glory. The new is so glorious. How can that which only shows us that we're sinners, deserving of condemnation, how can that be more glorious than that which actually delivers us from condemnation, right? That is far more glorious. Moses was no mediator of righteousness, but the Lord Jesus Christ is. Amen? Amen. Point number three. The ministry of the old versus the ministry of the new. Verse 11. For if what is passing away was glorious, then what remains is much more glorious. That which is passing away, it's temporary. It's the old. Faded as soon as Moses came down from the mountain, right? As you saw the shining of Moses' face fading. That which remains, the covenant that remains, is eternal. It is called the everlasting covenant. The everlasting covenant. Listen to this from Galatians chapter 3. What purpose then does the law serve? If all this is so much more glorious, what purpose then does the law serve? It was added, Paul says, because of transgressions. Until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Who's the seed? Jesus Christ. Until Jesus Christ should come to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not, Paul says. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, then truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture has confined all under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor. It was our guardian, so to speak, our instructor, our disciplinarian in order to bring us to Christ so that we might be justified by works. No. (laughs) So that we might be justified by faith. Right? The law is our tutor. It's our instructor. It's our disciplinarian to point us to Christ so that we might be justified by faith in Him. When you turn from your sin and you entrust yourself to Him, God says, you become a member of this covenant. By faith in Christ. But after faith has come, we no longer need a tutor. We're not under a tutor anymore. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. I love this. May the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do His will. Working in you... Not for your salvation. He has saved you. Now working in you what is well pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Glorious truths. The subjects of volumes. (laughs) What is the result of these glorious truths? What fruit, therefore, is then produced in the life of a believer. How are we to think about these things? Look at verse 12. Verse 12. Therefore, since we have such a glorious hope, such a glorious ministry, such a glorious such glorious truths, such glorious grace, such glorious mercy, such a glorious savior, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Great boldness, great zeal, great fervency. If anyone might have had a reason to throw in the towel due to a tough assignment, it would have been the Apostle Paul, right? But what does Paul say? We use great boldness of speech. 
Look at chapter 4, verse 1. Since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. Look at chapter 4, verse 13. I believed, therefore I spoke. Chapter 4, verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Chapter 5, verse 6. We are always confident. Right, this, is, this is intensely practical. Intensely practical. You consider the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ in the gospel. You meditate on the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ in the gospel. You'll become more fervent for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ in the gospel. I want it to be said of me. For you. For your good. I want it to be said of you. That we use such great boldness of speech. Because of the glory of the everlasting covenant. I want to see sinners come to faith in Christ and be saved. I want to see sinners saved. So that the Lord Jesus Christ will receive the full reward of his suffering. So that he will be glorified in it. We need to meditate on these truths. Commit them to our hearts. Commit them to our minds. Listen, if you have considered that you are not faithful in preaching the gospel, as you should be, maybe you've not considered before that this is your duty. Maybe it's that this has not been your delight. I would suggest to you, what Paul is saying here is consider this glory. Consider these truths and let it change your heart. Let them infuse your mind, renew your mind, repent of sin, and enter into that glorious work as a delight, not merely as a duty. If we have spirit-endowed knowledge and understanding of this hope, then boldness and zeal and earnestness and fervency will follow. Do you believe it? Amen. All praise, honor, and glory to Him who is Himself the glory of the new covenant.